Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm so good. How are you? Good. Oh my goodness. Great seeing you after all of these years. Oh, where'd you go? Oh, can you can you see me? It, yeah, now I can. Okay, perfect. I have awesome. not seen you in so long. I know. This is so exciting. It Thank is. you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I just finished up a long day of patience and yeah. I'm just plugging in my phone so I make sure I don't lose you. Okay, good. Perfect. All right. So let's uh, begin to start. So hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Fibroid Doc, where I share information with you to help you live a life free of bleeding and pain. And this um, month, we've been talking about fibroids and pregnancy. And so I am super excited to have uh, my dear friend and um, colleague, uh, Dr. Sarah Packman Shetty from New York join us today. And I'm going to um, just introduce her briefly and then I'll let her um, tell you more. So she's a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And we actually did residency together in New York many years ago. <laughs> we had fun. Didn't How we? much fun did we have though? We had so much fun, especially during night float. <laughs> I was just gonna say that night float gives me life with when <laughs> you're when you're there. So great! I will never <laughs> forget all our shenanigans. Um, so, yeah. So she uh, then went on to do so after residency at North Shore, which we did together. She then did a fellowship in uh, maternal fetal medicine, which is kind of focusing on high risk obstetrics and more complicated cases in pregnancy. And so, um, and then she, she practices there. So um, I'll let her tell you a little bit more about herself now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. It's super awesome to get to see you again yes. and to be part of your Instagram and you know how much I love Instagram. So being able to do this with you is super exciting. Um, I'm hold on so much better so that I can not move my phone as much. Um, let's see. I exactly what you said. I am a maternal fetal medicine physician. I practice high risk obstetrics in New York. I take care of all kinds of patients who have pregnancy complications or who come into pregnancy with issues and one of them is frequently fibroids. It's one it's the most common um, tumor of the female reproductive system. So I see fibroids and complications of fibroids in pregnancy pretty frequently. Yeah. So this whole month we've been um, talking about fibroids in pregnancy and we're going to wrap it up with a conversation with Dr. Pacman. So um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, Sarah, and then um, you can tell us a little bit about kind of what you see in day-to-day -day life with fibroids and pregnancy. So what is the most common way that you see fibroids affecting pregnancy? So I think fibroids in pregnancy, definitely the most common complication is um, pain from degeneration in the pregnant, during pregnancy. I'd say about 50% of fibroids are stable in size, but those are usually the smaller ones. And then the larger ones, greater than five centimeters or so, about 20, or the remaining 25% um, decrease in size and 25% get larger. And when they get larger, they run out of blood supply. So they degenerate, they start dying, and that hurts. Anytime you have a tissue inside of you that's not getting enough blood flow, it um, can hurt you. So we have a fair number of patients presenting with abdominal pain or pelvic pain in pregnancy. And we know that's from their degenerating fibroids. And it can be a little scary because you have to rule out things like preterm labor and cervical shortening and make sure that there's not something like an appendicitis or some other critical illness in going on in pregnancy. Um, whenever we have a pregnant patient present with pain, it can get complicated quickly because we have a uterus and a fetus in addition to the whole rest of the abdominal organs to rule out the cause. So um, definitely pain is the most common 
of the presentations. Occasionally, I'll see patients with such large fibroids or fibroids in the lower uterine segment, meaning the bottom portion of the uterus, that cause problems with having a vaginal delivery or um, cause problems with fetal malpresentation, meaning it can cause a breech baby or a transverse baby. Um, fibroids are associated with about a one and a half to two times risk increase of uh, preterm labor and preterm birth. So I'll frequently, pretty frequently see fibroid patients mm -hmm. presenting with preterm contractions and things like that. Yeah, so a lot could, a lot could go on. But yeah, definitely the pain. I remember seeing a lot of those patients in residency coming in, um, almost like looking like they're about to deliver, but really, you know, it's really the fibroid that's contracting yeah. pain. Um, so when, you know, sometimes patients, well, first of all, don't know that they have fibroids. So they get pregnant and then they suddenly discover they have fibroids during an ultrasound maybe. Um, but what about patients who know they have fibroids beforehand? Um, they've got, you know, maybe a four centimeter fibroid, so nothing too small, nothing too big. What kind of advice do you give those patients uh, prior to, you know, even conception? So I tell patients mostly with especially smaller fibroids like that, really kind of not to worry so much about it. It doesn't decrease your risk of conceiving, especially if it's an intramural or a subserosal, meaning on the outer layers of the uterus. Um, if it's bulging into the cavity of the uterus or it's causing very heavy periods because it's bulging into the cavity or it's already causing pain, then I consider at least uh, telling them, Maybe talk to your doctor about getting hysteroscopy, which is looking on the inside and mm -hmm. maybe taking out a part of that fibroid because it really is the cavity, the inside portion of the uterus that matters for um, right. pregnancy. So if it's, if it's something that's not affecting the inside shape of the uterus, I don't worry about it as much as or if it's a four centimeter fibroid that is. Right, okay. And yeah, not all fibroids grow in pregnancy. Some are just the same size. Um, so is there any way to predict? Um, I know hormones obviously have an effect on the way fibroids can grow in pregnancy, but uh, it's, you know, when a patient asks me, well, should I get it out um, or not? It's really hard to, hard, hard to sometimes answer that. But in your experience, are there any things that predict sort of which patients in which patients may grow versus not? I find, and I think the literature shows also that um, larger fibroids that are greater than five or six centimeters, those are more likely to grow during pregnancy than the smaller fibroids, the one to two centimeter ones mm -hmm. that sometimes aren't even diagnosed until pregnancy. Those are kind of, they've never been a big deal. They stay pretty stable. The larger ones can grow excessively large, like, and with dramatically so huge changes in pregnancy. So if patients have big fibroids and especially if they've experienced pregnancy loss that could or could not it's really it's often very hard to tell be related to um that fibroid being there or they're having very heavy periods or unpredictable periods or bleeding in between periods i'll say you know what get that checked out or get that removed before pregnancy it's mm -hmm. also a something to consider is how old are you and when do you want to be pregnant? Because especially if you have to have the fibroids removed abdominally or even lap with a laparoscope or robotically and it enters the cavity of the uterus, I want a significant amount of time, six months, eight months of healing before pregnancy, before implantation, just because you don't want to weaken the wall of that uterus and cause a uterine rupture or a placenta accreta or something like this in pregnancy that can be catastrophic to a pregnancy. It's important to have that time have passed for the body to heal itself and the uterus to heal itself. So before you get a pregnancy. So there's lots of factors that yeah. kind of go into a person's decision to have a fibroid removed before pregnancy. Yeah, and that's a good point because there's some planning that's involved, um, which is another reason why it's so important to go to your GYN yearly for a, a checkup because a lot of patients, you know, come to my office and have no idea they had a fibroid and it's, you know, huge. So clearly it's been there for a long time. But if you don't go see your doctor, a lot of 
people have no idea that they even have it um, because it's been so, slow growing. So yeah, another reason to check up and you know be aware of what's going on so you can plan appropriately. Um, Absolutely. So once fibers are diagnosed in pregnancy, um, what kind of monitoring do you recommend um, throughout the pregnancy? Depends on how big and how many fibroids there are. If there are a lot of fibroids or the fibroids are very large, I monitor those patients with cervical length surveillance or at least one or two cervical lengths um, between 16 and 24 weeks because it is associated with cervical shortening. Also, a lot of times I won't be able to see the cervix through an abdominal ultrasound. So I would recommend a transvaginal ultrasound to really actually assess the cervical length. Um, and then I'll watch closely for the fetal growth if I know that the um, placenta is over an area where there's a fibroid or there is a fibroid jutting into the cavity or there's very large fibroids. Because there are some theories that when the placenta is over an area of a fibroid, maybe it doesn't grow into that um, non-muscle tissue as well as it would um, if there was an absence of fibroids. And so then you could get Mm. less um, blood flow and less oxygen um, transfer through the placenta to the fetus. So I like to make sure that those babies are growing appropriately. Yeah, that's great. So that usually translates, yeah, to about sometimes in the third trimester, maybe every month, um, just to really make sure, yeah, that it's growing. Yeah. Okay. Also, another thing that I just thought of, in the later third trimester, I always like to make sure the baby's head down or vertex, cephalic presentation. Because frequently, especially with large fibroids or fibroids that are in the bottom half of the uterus, mm -hmm. you'll see the babies misbehaving and yeah. they'll end up with their butt down. And right. we need to know that before you can have a vaginal Which delivery. A whole different yeah. method of delivery. Um, <laughs> so, you know, say somebody presents to you, comes into your office with fibroids, you know, you mentioned that pain was one of the more, more, more frequent um, presentations. They're having a lot of pain. Their fibroid is getting, you know, big. At what point do you say, okay, like we got to remove it because even though you're pregnant and no one really wants to operate when you're pregnant, but you know, have you run into any circumstances where you're making that kind of decision? I, you know, I will say I have never removed a fibroid in pregnancy on purpose. I have removed a fibroid at time of cesarean delivery, um, but I wasn't happy about it because it's, it's so much more blood flow to a pregnant yeah. uterus than a non-pregnant uterus. And it can be a very, very challenging technically and for the patient's health because you can bleed a lot. The only time that I remove a, a fibroid at time of cesarean delivery is um, when it's in the way of me closing that uterine incision. I have to make an incision on the uterus in order to deliver the baby. And if um, fibroids are obstructing my ability to close that incision, I'll have to take them out. But um, it's not my favorite thing to do. Yeah. And I try to avoid it at all. And there's never a time in a pregnancy that I would consider doing a myomectomy unless it was at the time of delivery. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. A lot of patients ask me, well, if you're doing a C-section anyway, or, you know, can you just remove my fibroids? And, you know, I'm often saying no, because of your, your blood supply, as you mentioned, you really don't want to mess with that blood supply um, during pregnancy in the uterus. It's, it's a lot. Um, interestingly, I have done one uh, myomectomy during pregnancy. And I, um, you, for those watching, if you're interested in that story, I actually interviewed my patient and I'll post that on IGTV. It was a 23 centimeter fibroid. Um, so it was Whoa. Huge. And that baby, you know, wasn't, wasn't growing. I mean, it, we recognized this very early on and just in about eight weeks, it just ballooned from a four centimeter to a 23 centimeter fibroid. And this was when I was in fellowship actually. So we ended up doing a myomectomy and luckily everything went well, but um, it was super scary, but she did great. 
Yeah. And that was the first trimester by a mectomy? Yeah, it was around 12, 12 weeks just after the first trimester. Luckily, it was a subserosal fibroid or really kind of on the outside of the uterus. So we weren't really cutting into the muscle as much. And so it was, it, it went well, but it was definitely, definitely scary. But the only, the only experience I've had with removing, um, yeah, and a fibroid. When you did that case... Did you know where the placenta was in relation to this fibroid? You know, it was so, it was so, so um, early, early. And it, because it was subserosal, we didn't actually have to like cut into the wall and, you know, see, see the amniotic sac or, you know, we weren't anywhere that close. The, the, <laughs> the entire, and that would have been super scary, but the entire uterus was actually pushed up to the liver. So the uterus was pushed up to the liver and what was actually in the in the cavity was this huge fibroid that was kind of hanging off the uterus, really, truly subserosal. And so Whoa. it was almost kind of coming to like a stalk. And so we just focused on, you know, getting that out with cutting butt supply off to that stalk and then sort of doing the myomectomy. Um, yeah, but it was it was. But if we had left it in, I mean, it was just growing and growing and this baby wasn't going to grow. And so that is a crazy story. It was totally crazy. And yeah, I actually interviewed that patient last week and I was on a Facebook live, but I'm going to put it on Instagram. So for those of yeah. you who have fibroids in pregnancy, definitely check that out. Um, I'm so, so interested in listening to that interview. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But everything went well and she was actually able to have a vaginal delivery. Um, and yeah, it was, it was all very cool. Good. Yeah. I've never um, seen a case like that. I can't. Yeah, really have to say. always something interesting in our field. <laughs> yeah, Every I would day. say one thing though, Cherba. Yeah, I would have been scared for her. <laughs> I was waiting for that line. <laughs> I would have been scared for her. I was very scared. <laughs> but but you know, my fellowship director, Doctor Brawl, he wasn't you know, scared. <laughs> he really. He was really excited about taking the case on, which was awesome, because um, I was a second year fellow at that time. And um, you're like, I was bring like, it. Yeah. I was like, yeah, no one really wants to do this case. You want to do it? And you know, he's he was great. And so, yeah. Do you see him, by the way, still? Um, I don't, but he's the mayor of Great Neck. <laughs> That's right. So I follow him on Facebook, and I hear <laughs> I I know what's happening in Great Neck. <laughs> <laughs> And that's great. It's so um, funny. Yeah, so fun. Okay, and then let's see. Um, any so, so it seems like you said you haven't done a fibroid um, surgery during um, pregnancy, but if you had to, are there any other considerations that you know special considerations that you would think of um, other than, of course, we have to counsel the patient that you know we're obviously doing this because it's an absolute necessity, necessity um, but there is a chance of miscarriage. Anything else that you think of that, you know? I mean, I think in a case like that, gestational age would be like critical. Um, at 20 to 32 weeks, the blood volume in a pregnant patient's body doubles. Um, and there's increased flow to the uterus because your cardiac output is pumping blood to or in order to um, facilitate oxygen delivery to a growing fetus. Um, after 24 weeks, it's very state dependent, but after 24 weeks, and at least in the state of New York, um, a fetus is considered viable. And if we, for some reason, were to get into a uterus, but like I said, this is not something that I've ever undertaken or I would be extremely uncomfortable yeah. undertaking a myomectomy um, in a patient with a second trimester pregnancy. I just think it would be yeah. very dangerous because you could lose the pregnancy. Of course. And yeah. so there, you would have to have a very compelling reason for me to yeah. think about taking out someone's fibroid in pregnancy. Of course, yes. So, I mean, obviously we're concerned about the baby and the size and the blood supply, right. but, but also risk of anesthesia to the of patient course. and all of that as well. Um, like you're a full stomach, you can aspirate. Um, that's, a, that's a really risky yeah. problem. You can yeah. rupture your uterus afterwards. Yes, 
Yes. I'd say that's about as high risk as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of rupture of uterus, um, you know, once somebody has had a fibroid surgery, not necessarily during pregnancy, but just, you know, they've had a fibroid surgery, you mentioned waiting a certain amount of time um, prior to getting pregnant. Um, after that, what sort of determines whether a patient has a C-section or can have a normal delivery? So I always look at the operative report from the patient's myomectomy, and that's why I love gynecologists who um, talk about where the fibroids were in their operative report and the layers of the uterus that they puncture and how big the incisions were, because I need to know the most important thing that I need to know is did they enter the, ca the endometrial cavity or not? If you entered the endometrial cavity, I consider as if you had a classical cesarean delivery. That full <laughs> thickness of the wall of the uterus has now been compromised. It's not muscle because just like how you cut on your arm and you have a scar tissue there or on your skin somewhere, you have scar tissue in that, in that muscular portion of the uterus, especially if it's high up at the uterus, that should be thicker muscle. It stretches yeah. later. Um, and if that's the case, having a scar tissue, that scar tissue is much weaker than muscle. And it really can't, it doesn't contract and expand the way muscle tissue does. And so I recommend a cesarean delivery by 37, sometimes even 36 weeks in patients with a full thickness um, removal of fibroids. So if you have a myomectomy before pregnancy, a really important question to ask, I, and sometimes I will say, um, you know, did, ask your doctor, did they tell you you needed a C-section? And if yeah. they said, yes, they told me I needed a C-section for sure, I'll look extra in the op report to make sure that it really was full thickness. Um, otherwise, um, I say, you know, if it wasn't or if it was smaller fibroids, you can have a vaginal delivery, but I'm very, very cautious to tell patients, if you have pain, you don't take it very seriously. If you feel dizzy, take it very seriously because it's things like uterine rupture that can be catastrophic to a pregnancy, catastrophic to a mother, and um, the incre there's an increased risk depending on the size and the location of the fibroid that was removed. Yeah, that's a great point. And even if it wasn't full thickness and it was just really in the muscle, if it was a really large incision, then it's the same thing that I tell patients, you know, if it was really I'm cutting from one end of the uterus to another to take out a 12 centimeter fibroid, then it, it fall, falls under the same category right? as well. So yeah, if you're a patient undergoing um, fibroid surgery and you plan on getting pregnant, uh, one of the most important questions, as Sarah mentioned, was really asking your doctor, can I have a vaginal delivery or do I need a C-section? And maybe even getting a, re a report of, of the oper a copy of the operative report and, and taking it with you to your to your doctor. Record. For sure, that's super so helpful. helpful. Yes, super helpful. Luckily, with electronic medical records, now we can sort of scramble and find things, but it's it's so much it's um, so much better I mean, if you just show up with, the, with that op report. Um, all right. Anything else that you want to mention about fibroids in pregnancy, either from your own experience um, in mm. practice or anything that you wish patients knew? Uh, you know, I treat pain in pregnancy because of fibroids very frequently. And I treat it with a medicine called indomethacin or indocin. Um, it's a very, very strong Motrin. And normally you can't take Motrin in pregnancy, um, depending on the time that it's necessary in pregnancy. Um, it can be harmful to a growing baby. In for situations like fibroids where we need it, we give it in very short courses, like 48 to 72 hours. It kind of calms down some of that inflammation and then hopefully the pain is resolved. I do have patients who need several courses in pregnancy, but I will say, you know, when fibroids are gonna grow in pregnancy, they grow in the first trimester. Hmm. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. I, I rarely see them growing in late later on in pregnancy so if you haven't had any pain from your fibroids by 2016 to 20 weeks hopefully knock on wood and it would be very unlucky if you did have pain after that point so um I, i'm i'm less worried about giving the indomethacin in the first trimester so that's yeah. good news also 
Yeah. Um, what else? I definitely, anyone who wants to be pregnant should have a preconception consultation. Find a doctor you trust, maternal fetal medicine, or just your regular OBGYN, and ask questions. You know, if you feel like it's never wrong to go and get an exam, and if you find out how you that you have fibroids, ask questions. Say, is this going to impact a pregnancy? Would you get it removed? What, how would you remove it? If you wouldn't remove it, why not? You know, it's never yes. wrong to know more about your body and to be proactive about your health. Yeah, that's a great point. Rather than getting pregnant and then finding out, you know, you're right. like, even a fibroid or something like that. Sometimes yeah. I have patients who come to me who I'm like, this fibroid can't feel good. You yeah. can't, it, it's, and yeah. it's hard to know because fibroids can be very slow growing. So when it's your own body and it grows after a very long period of time, you might not notice the change. Where if it's something like a pregnancy that's growing in a very short period of time, you notice when your abdomen's getting bigger. So it's never, it's always beneficial to get checked out if you're a person who wants to be pregnant early on. Yeah, no, that's a super important point. Um, or before. Luckily, yeah, luckily more patients are doing that, but you're right, you don't want to find yourself surprised, you know, got one or two or three or four fibroids that and you're already pregnant and now you're just kind of scrambling. Um, with symptoms and scrambling for options. Um, totally. So awesome. Well, thank you so much for all this wonderful um, information. Where can patients find you? Where can people find you, those who are pregnant, interested in pregnancy? I am on Instagram, Healthy Mama Doc. This is my Instagram handle. I'm so excited to have anyone come and um, ask questions. DM me. I have all kinds of posts about all different pregnancy topics. And I'm going to hopefully be able to share this to my Instagram live or stories also. Yeah. So that more of my um, Instagram audience can find you as well. Yeah, definitely. And um, Dr. Pacman has been doing a couple of lives as well on the COVID vaccine and pregnancy. So if you've been interested in that or curious, please check um check that account out and follow her. And if you're somebody with fibroids um, or know somebody with fibroids, um, please uh, find me, uh, the fibroid doc on Instagram, as well as uh, on YouTube. And um, yeah, I would love to, would love to have you there and feel free to send me questions as well. Um, awesome. Well, I thank you. absolutely love what you've been doing with your Instagram. It's oh, so cool. Thank you. Thank you yeah, so much. You've been and you as so well. Awesome. You've been an inspiration and helping so many women out. So, so proud of you. Proud to know you. So, thank you, everybody. Thanks. And we will talk to you later. All okay. right. Bye. Bye, Trish. Bye. Bye bye.